You're listening to FBC Radio on 16.9. Good morning, church and community. Today is Sunday the 16th of August 2020 and that means that today is the 43rd anniversary of the death of Elvis Presley. He was a man known for both his revolutionary contribution to rock and roll music and his passionate love for gospel music. Whilst he recorded over 600 songs he only ever won three Grammy Awards and they were all for gospel songs. Elvis was often referred to as being the king, but at one concert in 1974 he saw a sign saying Elvis is king and this was his response. Oh thank you darling, thank you. The thought is beautiful dear and I love you for it, but I haven't been caught up in this thing and I can't accept this kingship thing because to me there's only one, which is Christ. We cannot be sure as to where Elvis stood spiritually, but we can certainly agree with his acknowledgement of the kingship of Jesus. As other musicians have put it, Jesus is King, and I will extol him. Give him the glory and honour his name. He reigns on high, enthroned in the heavens. Word of the Father, exalted for us. Let's pray. As we come to you this morning, Lord, we do so acknowledging that Jesus is King. He is the name above all other names, and in his presence we can but bow and lay our all before him now. In royal robes we don't deserve. We live to serve our majesty. Lord, in all the hustle and bustle of daily life, within all the difficulties and the joys, within our failures and our successes, we are glad and grateful to be able to worship you freely today. Lord, please receive our praise and adoration in recognition of who you are and all you have done as we come to worship you, the author of salvation. Thank you, Lord. Amen. to our God who sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb praise and glory wisdom and thanks honor and power and strength be to our God Today's children's talk is being given by Katie. Hi everyone. So today we're thinking about doing things differently. Now before I speak to you, I want you to watch this video and tell me if this is how you would normally do it.
day. So I don't know about you, but that's not quite how I normally would make a cup of tea. I chose to do it this week slightly differently to see if it made a difference to the taste. I can tell you it did a little bit. So there are other ways that we can think of doing things differently. So for example, recently we've been listening to church online. Maybe you've been doing it on the sofa, maybe from the dining room, maybe from the garden, or maybe even from bed, but that's okay. We've had to do things slightly differently. Or perhaps now it's from Friday that we need to wear face coverings that when we go to the shops. Maybe this isn't something you're used to, maybe this is really different, but it is keeping us safe. Or maybe, like the person in the picture, you have been doing things really differently in a really strange way. Perhaps you've been walking on your hands instead of your feet recently, doing handstands or cartwheels or different things that have been fun to do outside. So this week I tried two very different things. The first thing I tried was to cut the grass with a pair of scissors. Now our grass was getting quite long, so I thought this is gonna be great. We can cut scissors, don't need to get the lawnmower out, perfect. As you can see, it maybe wasn't the best idea I'd ever had. It took quite a long time, but the grass did get cut, even if it was a little different. The other thing that we tried was after cutting all the grass, we decided I needed to kind of cool off a little bit. So I tried to have a shower with a watering can. You ready? You ready for this, right? No. Do you want to do it anyway? Go for it. As you can see from that video, it perhaps wasn't the best idea. The nice warm water from the shower wasn't quite what we got from the watering can, although I think my husband had a lot of fun doing it. Now, these are all different examples of being different. And actually, whilst not all of them are bad ideas, or the good approaches like wearing a mask keeps us safe, staying at home to listen to the services keeps us safe at the moment, different can be good. But what we're gonna to learn today in the Bible study was that Jesus tries to teach people the need to do things differently. He tried to explain that the old ways and approaches that people were using from the Old Testament weren't quite as relevant now. And that actually he came to the earth to teach us the ways of doing things. Maybe it was through his words, maybe it was through his actions. But the people at the time kept thinking, this is really different, this is not what we're used to. So whilst things are different at the moment, I want you to remember that we can still be different in a really good way. We can represent God's love to so many people. If we keep learning about him and become more like him, we can be different from the people around us by showing such an immeasurable amount of love as God has loved us. So I'm gonna set you a challenge for this week. I want you to do something that's a little different in a really good way. Perhaps it's inviting someone to come along to an online event to do with youth club or children's work or things. Perhaps you could invite someone to watch an online service. Perhaps you could talk to them about what makes things important to you or write a letter to someone that you haven't spoken to in a really long time. Do something this week that is really different for the right reasons and a really good thing, showing God's love to other people. Have fun. And now it's time for Family News. If you're one of those who a few months ago received sunflower seeds from Joe and planted them, then please do send us some pictures of what they're looking like now, with you alongside them. Alex planted her sunflower seeds in this pot, and this is what has grown in it. Looks nice, but we're not sure they're sunflowers. The mystery continues. Just to confirm what sunflowers should look like, Fiona has been growing these magnificent specimens. And although she didn't use Joe's seeds, hopefully anyone who has will be able to produce something similar. We have a couple of very proud parents at FBC at the moment. Congratulations to Mark and Jill's daughter Lauren as she got married on Friday the 7th. We pray that God will truly bless her and David as they begin their married life together. Also congratulations to David and Karen's son Jeremy who has just finished his time as a ministerial assistant in Chelsea and has now moved with his family to Oak Hill Bible College to start a three-year course there to train as a vicar. If you'd like to join in with our FBC Zoom meeting, then it will be starting immediately after this service is finished 
and the login codes will have been emailed to you on Friday. Most of you will now know that we plan to reopen the church on the 6th of September and the idea for the first meetings will be that we will gather together, socially distanced and simply listen and watch the online service in the main hall. We will be required to wear a mask throughout the service and unfortunately we will not be permitted to sing along to the songs that will be played on the screen. But we will have the opportunity to at least see a number of others from the church who we may not have seen for a few months. If you're wanting to attend the Sunday morning services, then you must book a seat online. And details of how to do that will appear in next week's Family News and also will be emailed out to everyone. Next Sunday, during our online service, we will be sharing in communion towards the end. And therefore, if you'd like to take part in this, then please make sure that you have some bread and wine or juice prepared prior to the service. And thank you to Phil and Grace for providing some pictures that they took last time we celebrated communion together and we will be using these during the service next week. And next week something else will be happening and here's a preview. I still think I was on to a winner and so I've designed chilli and marmite dog biscuits. As you know, I like to win a lot. My financial pedigree leaves nothing to be desired. Chili and Marmite. This sounds absolutely revolting. I, I can imagine how much it's costing you to import this Marmite from Chile. How are you going to make enough? Where are you going to make enough? You want all that money from me. But the dog is OK. I'm very glad the dog's OK. And it, and it actually still tastes quite nice. Northern dogs are never going to go for this foo-foo flavour. And for that reason, I'm out. I'm out. You're fired. I mean, I'm out. I'm going to offer you all of the money and all the help you need. So don't dare miss next week's service. But in regards to this service, that brings us to the end of Family News! At FBC, we support a few people in Christian Mission, including Stu and Amy Matheson working with YWAM Mission Adventures, Mark and Sue Venning working with YWAM Wales, Pam Davis, who's been a minister in training at 57 West in Southend on Sea, and Paul and Sarah Brown working in Thailand. We're glad that nearly all of these have been able to speak at one of our services at the church during the last year. All that is except for Paul and Sarah. And so I thought it would be good if we took this opportunity to hear from them this morning as they share about some of their work with BMS Mission in Thailand. Hi, we're Paul and Sarah Brown. We are BMS workers uh, serving in Thailand. We've been here now for over seven years. Most of that time was spent in Bangkok. Uh, but last year, February, we moved to Chiang Mai, which is in the north of Thailand with the aim of setting up a business as missions, selling creative cakes with the hope of providing employment to those at risk. We also work for the New Life Center Foundation, which is a Christian organization working in the areas of prevention, protection, and development of survivors of social and economic exploitation. Uh, my role is uh, in administration. I do a bit of IT and finance. And I also work on the planning of the business's mission as well. I also work for New Life Centre teaching to the girls that are aged 11 to 22 years old um, that live at the residency house of New Life Centre, teaching them baking, cake decorating through New Life Centre's foundation's rehabilitation programme. Currently, we are working from home as um, requested by both the government and New Life Centre. Um, at the moment, it's probably best anyway, because outside uh, here in Chiang Mai, the uh, pollution is hazardous. Um, and it's actually 40 times the uh, international standard. Um, so at the moment, Chiang Mai is the most polluted city in the world. There's also no international flights at the moment and no travel um, actually through different provinces. 
Um, there are actually checkpoints set up at the provinces, so if you try to go through them, you will be stopped and questioned. Um, we do also have a curfew here in Chiang Mai, which is from the hours of 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. in the morning. Some provinces have stricter um, lockdowns and curfew times because the cases, the number of cases of COVID-19 is actually a lot higher. Um, everybody has been requested to wear um, a mask. We are obviously not wearing a mask now at the moment because we're actually at home in our garden. Um, but wherever you go outside, um, you are required to wear a mask. And also when you go to the supermarkets, they are testing you for your temperature and also providing you with hand sanitizer. Um, people are also wearing clear visors as well, which maybe some people in the UK are also wearing as well. Um, this side of the world, including Thailand, obviously has experienced experience before from um, novel viruses um, such as SARS and MERS. So therefore, everybody is taking the situation um, very seriously. We are now going to take you through um, with, with some photos that we've actually got to show you the work that New Life Centre is doing in their response and also the local church House of Praise is doing in response to COVID-19. In March before the Thai government enforced the emergency decree, most of the girls at New Life Centre's resident home travelled back to rural villages to stay with family or friends for the school summer holidays. From a recent update, all of the New Life Centre Foundation students and their families are safe and well. This photo is of one of the students who recently graduated with her mum. Uh, and also this photo is basically some of the students again that graduated, but also with New Life Centre Foundation staff as well. Our local church, House of Praise, through its Christian outreach centre called Project Love, has been reaching out to those in May Sot on the Thai-Burma border who have been made homeless in Thailand during the COVID-19 outbreak. Many have already been given help and relief from their desperation and with the good news that God loves them. The House of Praise border teams are working tirelessly among 500 families who have been caught up by the economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and those that are stateless. Neither Burma or Thailand want to help them. Generations of families tend to live together in the same house, so the virus could move quickly through these communities. If coronavirus spreads more rapidly, the poverty will be devastating. Many Thais do not have savings to fall back on and generally live hand to mouth. Under the current lockdown, Non-essential shops have been closed down. Many have become unemployed and many are due to lose their jobs. The government has promised to help out with funding, but it has not materialised yet. As of the time of recording, Thailand situation, there are 2,643 confirmed cases of COVID and with 30 new cases and 43 deaths. We have been following developments in the UK and remember you in our prayers. Please continue to pray for us here in Thailand, as well as the BMS workers around the world. We really appreciate your prayers and support.
David is leading us in our prayers this morning. Dear God, we do want to thank you that you care for us, that you're interested in us, that you know us and that we can call you our Father. And thank you that you love us no matter where we are or how we're feeling right now. And as we talk to you, we would ask that you would help us to come before you and pray and that you would have mercy on us and hear our prayers. And we want to pray for our world today. There seems to be so many challenges facing different countries. And there are so many people who are struggling, whether through illness, poverty, persecution, loneliness, and the feeling that there is little hope. We would pray for them, for the leaders of nations to make wise decisions that will benefit their people, and especially for the various aid agencies who are so stretched trying to bring food, security, comfort and hope to many communities, both in the UK and overseas at this time. We'd pray for your church here in the UK and also overseas. Thank you for how so many have engaged with services online. And we'd pray for th that these services would continue to be relevant and continue to reach out to those who normally attend church, but also to those who do not do so so regularly. Thank you also for the way that so many churches have been involved with supporting the different community projects and food banks. 
And we do want to thank you that we as Finley Baptist Church are still able to worship and have fellowship together despite not being able to meet in person. We pray for our Pastor Glynn and the ministry team as they discuss the best way forward for, for us as a church. Guide and direct them in the decisions that need to be made. And for those we support as a church, for Paul and Sarah Brown in Thailand, for the Venning family and for Stu and Amy Matheson, we pray that you would bless them and strengthen them in the work that they have been called to do. And for each member of the church in the work that you have called them to do, whether working from home, returning to their workplace or at the moment without employment, please be with them and help them. And especially for those from our church who are struggling at this time, we thank you that you know all of our situations and circumstances and we do want to pray for each other, that you would comfort us and bring your peace to our situations. We thank you that our life groups, our children and young people have all been able to continue to meet regularly on Zoom and we do pray that you'd continue to bless our time of meeting together in this way. Even though there is some frustration with the technology, I do pray that we would not give up meeting together and sharing, challenging and encouraging each other. And finally, we would pray for ourselves, whether we're feeling great or possibly struggling. We thank you that you know our particular needs. We would ask that you would help us to stay close to you and be open to your spirit leading and guiding us. And now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Richard is our speaker today and before he brings the word, Leone is going to read us the Bible passage that we will be considering today. The reading is Luke chapter 6, starting at verse 37 and going on till 49. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. He also told them this parable. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a pit? The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the plank out of your eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognised by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When the flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it 
because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. We're coming close now to the end of our sermon series titled Galilean Grace. It all began with Jesus reading from the scroll written by the prophet Isaiah in the temple in Nazareth, his hometown, where he read that he was being sent to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of the sight for the blind, to release the oppressed and proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Interestingly, if you look in the dictionary, you'll see one of the synonyms for grace is favour. Jesus was proclaiming the year of the Lord's favour. And as he's gone round, he has been talking of God's love, God's forgiveness, God's generosity and blessing to the people as he's been healing. And he's been saying that they are welcome. They're God's friends and that they can live a new life. In chapter 6, we find Jesus in a level place in the Galilean region, a plain. And he's delivering a sermon to the crowds and the people that are are coming around him, not just his disciples. He starts off with a set of beatitudes similar to those that we see recorded in Matthew's Gospel. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And warnings, but woe to you who are rich, for you've already received your comfort. But he doesn't want to leave people with just sound bites like those, although they will last 2,000 years. He wants this to be practical advice, instructions on how to live, how to react. In fact, everything on this is relational, and it goes way deeper than the words that we say to one another. It's getting right down into our attitudes about one another. He says that we must love our enemies, not just be nice to them, but we must love our enemies, that we mustn't judge or condemn that we must be forgiving and generous instead. He says that we must not be hypocritical and pointing out faults in other people that are actually there in ourselves. We must deal with ourselves and sort out our own faults before we go after somebody else. And two wonderful illustrations for a rural community. He takes trees and says, you can tell how good a tree is by the quality of the fruit that it bears. And also, if you're the person who ignores his advice, you ignore and don't put into practice his words, you're like the person who builds a house on sand because your life is there without foundation. You haven't dug deep, and when the storms come, it'll knock your house down. Instead, apply his words to your life, act them out, put them in practice, and you're like the person who's built your house on rock. In the middle is a little piece that's worth mentioning. He also told them this parable, can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A student is not above his teacher. He's here referring to the Pharisees, the people who haven't recognized his lordship, who don't see him as Messiah. They haven't understood the kingdom of God. They're like the blind leading the blind. And what's going to happen is that they're going to fall into a pit. They're going to trip over. It's going to come to grief because they're blind, they're not following his instructions. So let's take the first part. Let's take the part of of the judging. So we think of a judge, we usually think of somebody who's examining, finding fault, who's wanting to, to apportion blame, see who was in the wrong. We're told not to do that. We're to be a set-apart community where we love one another, where we're forgiving to one another, where we're generous to one another. We're to be different. And so when I think just right now about the, the coronavirus situation, it would be so easy to be judging. And there's an inquiry going on, isn't there, into the government's handling of the whole of this. And no doubt it'll be critical at times. But it's always easy to be critical in hindsight. If you can only think back to the state and the, the shoes they were in at the time, the knowledge they had, the situation in the world and in the country, they acted on the best advice they had at the time. Maybe things didn't go right, but it's such a hard decision they had to make. If we, if we think of the Lebanese authorities, and if there are so many who are criticizing them for having stored ammonium nitrate right in the middle of the port, right next to the grain silos, right on the edge of the city there. And yet Lebanon has been torn apart by civil war, by strife, by disagreements between the different factions 
in that country. It is so desperately poor and imports almost all of its food and so on. If we put ourselves in their shoes, would we have been able to sort that out? Would moving that ammonium nitrate have been our priority over feeding other people and dealing with other immediate issues? If we think of somebody, if we're walking around a supermarket and there's somebody without a mask, do we immediately judge them instead of thinking, well, maybe they can't have a mask? Maybe there's a condition, there's a reason, there's a mental state that means they just can't. Or maybe they've just forgotten it. And haven't we forgotten things in the past as well? We can so easy to lay into people without knowing the whole picture. And when we do so, we forget that we have been forgiven, that we've been given a whole new chance by Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection. A new life has been given to us. And more than that, God has continued to be generous by having his Holy Spirit live in us, blessing us, answering our prayers, caring for us, protecting us, guiding us, and so on. We need to give others a second chance. We need to give them the benefit of the doubt, if you like. And as the Bible says, leave judgment to God. The most powerful illustration that Jesus gave us of not judging somebody else was when the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought before him a woman caught in the act of adultery. They asked him about whether he thought that she should be stoned. He ignored them for a while and just wrote in the sand on the ground with his finger, but they kept on pestering him, asking him, asking him, asking him. So he turned to them and said, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. He bent down, broke the eye contact with them, and it was when he looked up again he asked the woman, Where have all of them accusers gone? And they'd all left. Well, if they don't condemn you, nor do I, Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. So much more powerful to forgive the woman, to allow her a second chance, to give her an opportunity to mend her ways and behave differently. The second illustration about the, the, the hypocrisy of having a, a plank in our own eye, as it's described, it's caricatured to bring out the effect, is something that's been, been brought out many times in over the centuries, um, in cartoons and in, in paintings and engravings. Here, Jesus is saying that we mustn't think we are any better than others that we mustn't be ignoring the faults in ourselves while we spot all of the, the issues, the problems, the mistakes that others make and the, the um, bad practices, the bad habits, the bad behaviours in other people. How often do we criticise somebody for driving too fast and forget that when we were in a hurry, we went over the speed limit? Or when we've forgotten that the Blackwater Valley Road is now a 50-mile-an-hour road through Farnborough to reduce the pollution? And there we go sailing through at 60 miles an hour like we always have for the last 15, 20 years. So many ways we forget that we are guilty of exactly the same things. They're faults in us and we mustn't be hypocritical to other people. Instead, we should inspect ourselves and try to make ourselves better, try to work on ourselves to become more Christ-like. Our condemnation and our criticism of other people is so hurtful to them when we express it, when we speak it out, when we say things to them. And so it's not surprising that James talks of the tongue, or that though it's a very small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. Our words can cause great, great damage. But it's the attitudes within us that Jesus is also speaking to not just the things that come out from us that show what our heart is like, but he's asking us to change the very hearts within us that our attitudes might be changed at the core. And so it is that nobody can teach on these words without recognizing and confessing that they too are critical, are judging, are condemning, aren't as generous as they should be and forgiving as they ought to be that we're hypocritical, and I know all these things are true of me, and I confess them now before God and ask for his forgiveness. None of us is perfect, as Paul said in Romans chapter 3, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
but how good it is that through Jesus we have a God who forgives our sin, that when we confess and we come before him penitent, then he forgives us and gives us a new start. Illustration then moves on to fruit trees. And I could imagine that around Jesus in this plain area, there might well have been an orchard within sight. And so he comments to people around that no good tree bears bad fruit, and nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. You can recognize the state of a tree by its fruit. If it's healthy, it'll have a good crop, rosy apples and, and plump figs and so on. But if the tree is bad, if its roots are damaged, if it's unhealthy, diseased, then the fruit on it will be too. It'll be shriveled. It won't be tasty. It won't be a good high crop. Jesus is saying this must be for us too. That for his followers, they could be judged by their fruit. In Galatians, Paul writes of the fruit of the Spirit. Love and joy, peace and patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control, and so on. Jesus is saying that we must be showing how good we are through the fruit. In other words, our graciousness, the way we treat other people. And as we were saying, that requires a change of heart right through. We know that our God is faithful and just and will forgive all those who come before him in confession. Those who are repentant and intent on turning around. But that forgiveness is not license to allow the tree that it is us to be uncared for. We have some th trees in our garden, and we know that for those fruit trees to continue to bear fruit, we must do three things for them. We must prune them back. We must ensure that they get enough water, and we must ensure that they get enough nourishment. We have to prune them back to remove the dead wood, the places where the branches are rubbing against one another and it could get diseased. And for our lives, that's where we must look at our behaviours, where we are judging, where we're critical, where we're not generous, where we're being hypocritical, and change those behaviours. We must look at where we're watching the wrong things, or reading the wrong material, or mixing with the wrong crowds, and we must cut those off, that they won't badly influence and infect the rest of us, and lead us to become bad trees. We must ensure that our trees have got enough water. When we're getting a dry summer like this one, we'll water the trees to make sure that they, they're they still staying healthy and that the fruit grows and is plump and juicy. And, and for us as individuals, that's all down to tapping into God's Holy Spirit, allowing him to work through us, to change us, to fill us with Jesus's living water, to transform us, to give us the the life. And for that, we'll need to be praying. We'll need to be spending time with God and being with him. The nourishment that our trees, we will fertilize them every now and then. Our lives need it rather more frequently than that. And I, I confess that regular Bible study is something I've always struggled with. But it is vital to us that we are nourishing ourselves by the reading of his word, learning his instruction and finding his guidance for our lives. The Bible is our source of nourishment, our fertilizing. Jesus moves on from the illustration of a tree and moves to the foundations of a house. We love the way that um, Nick Butterworth and Mick Inkpen illustrated this story and brought it out for, for our children in The House on the Rock. And of course, there are great similarities between the foundations of a house and the roots of the tree. Both of them are there to ground that building, that tree, so that when storms blow, when earthquakes hit, that tree, that house, stay strong, stay standing, and are still there. The illustration for our lives is that as we are a tree or we are a building, when the storm hits, we will stay standing. We will stay true to God. We will still be faithful to him, producing fruit and a witness for him without collapsing in a big heap. The foolish builder is the person who hasn't listened to Jesus's words or listens to them and completely ignores them, not putting them into practice. They build their house as if it's the, a quick thing. It's, it's unnecessary to put much effort into it. And on it goes on the sand. It's constructed quickly. They whistle while they work and all they think all is well. But when the storm comes, that building, their lives collapse in a big heap and are washed away. The person who puts effort into building their house, who dig down and put their foundations onto a rock, 
Their building stands strong when the storms of life hit. Here are the foundations of part of our house when it was extended the other year. What better way to, to show how deep they are than to place our young daughter Sarah into the trench to show that it was right up to her armpits. Those foundations were dug deep. Many places they have to go very much deeper and we'll have to put piling in through weak and soft soil in order to be able to put a, a strong foundation for a tall skyscraper. There's two things I note, though, about foundations and buildings. Firstly is that very often the failure is gradual, although in the story the storm comes and that weak house fell down in one, one go. So often the trouble with foundations is seen in a gradual decay, cracks that gradually appear, and maybe then doors don't close, windows don't quite fit. The cracks come through on the brickwork, through to the plaster, and maybe across ceilings, and the house is then in real danger and must be underpinned to secure it. But there's nothing as good as a, an initial proper foundation. We've got some problems on our patio because the ground underneath has settled over the years and I've had to underpin that and it takes an enormous amount of effort and I know that there's quite the chance that that will continue to happen even with my underpinning and in five or ten years time we'll see the slabs move again and then we really will need to dig the whole lot up and start again. It's true the same with our lives that if they're not built on a foundation all seems good at first. Like a tree that's just been planted, while it's being watered regularly and it's a young tree, it delivers some fruit and is a nice thing to see. But if those roots aren't deep, gradually over time it stops growing as well as it should, the crop begins to reduce and the crop isn't as healthy. The problem is we can't see either the roots or the foundations of a building. They're below ground, they're out of sight. You'd need ground-penetrating radar or x-ray or something to actually see their quality underground. And to put those roots down takes the tree a lot of effort. To put the foundations down takes a lot of hard work. We need to put that effort in. We need to take that time to ensure that our foundations are strong. Our roots have gone deep. And what are we putting them down to? We're putting them down to the rock that is Jesus. And so what can I say in conclusion? We must be like the psalmist who said, The Lord is my rock, my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, where I seek refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I know that Dwayne Johnson has coined the phrase for himself as being the rock, but no, Jesus Christ must be our rock. It must be on him, as Brian Dirksen said, that we depend upon. Faithful one, so unchanging, ageless one, you're my rock of peace. Lord of all, I depend upon you. I call out to you again and again. You are my rock in times of trouble. You lift me up when I fall down. All through the storm, your love is the anchor. My hope is in you alone. Remember, Jesus said that when we put his words into practice, when we take them to heart, when we change our whole being to be in tune with those, then we're building our house on a rock foundation. And as Jeremiah and one of the psalmists put it, we must be pushing our roots down towards that living water, because then we will be, as Jeremiah says, like a tree planted near a stream, whose roots spread out towards the water. It has nothing to fear when the heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no need to be concerned in a year of drought. It does not stop bearing fruit. God's Holy Spirit is that life spring that water in a dry land, that nourishment that we need. It must be him that we must be open to, tapping into and building our lives upon. So how do we do this in practice? And I'd suggest that each one of us must give ourselves an X-ray, an MRI scan of those things that nobody else can see. We need to be like a judge asking questions, asking God to examine us, and see our faults, that we might put them right. We might ask ourselves, perhaps each day, 
how have I done today? And perhaps using just these things that Jesus talked about and is recorded in Luke chapter 6, judging, condemning, generosity, forgiveness, hypocrisy. Take those things and just say, how have I done in those areas today and this week? We should pray for guidance and grace for tomorrow that we can behave better, act more generously, more kindly, more Christ-like to other people. When we catch ourselves in a situation where we could judge, ask ourselves, do I know all the details? Is there something I don't see? Is there something that I don't know? Is there a reason why this person's behaving like this or doing whatever it is that we don't think is right? We need to give them the second chance, the benefit of the doubt. Leave the condemnation to Jesus, as just as he did with the lady caught in adultery. As we put Jesus' words into practice, when we see a fault in somebody else, let's ask ourselves first before we say anything, before we criticise or judge, are we guilty of exactly the same? Is that a fault within us too? And then we need to be looking at how we might correct that. Perhaps they've noticed it in us as well. And just to finish, we must show Galilean grace to those around us. We must forgive. We must be loving. We must be generous and build this community that Jesus spoke of and bring about the year of the Lord's favour.
brings us to the end of today's service. Thank you for being part of it. We hope you'll be able to join us again next week. May the Lord bless you and make you a blessing this week to others. You've been listening to FBC Radio on 16.9.